Well, they say it's the most wonderful time of the year. Now, this is the time after Thanksgiving, the only proper time to start decorating for Christmas. As God intended. Now, this was the time when I was a child that we would start decorating the house. And the most important part, at least for me and my family, was to get the box of Christmas movies from the top shelf. We'd take this box down and open it up. This was the only time these movies were brought out into family circulation. We'd open this box and we'd see a plethora of VHS tapes. Okay, what's a VHS tape? I don't know if you guys know. It's a black rectangle that had a magnetic strip that would play movies. Um, also had DVDs, but the fun thing about the old technology is you could record Christmas shows off of the television. I know, it was amazing. And you had to run up and hit pause because you didn't want those commercials because you had more on the tape. But we stuck them in. So we had the library of these movies off the TV that we brought up for every Christmas season. Now, something about the Christmas movies was interesting is that there's only two different types of Christmas movies. In one camp, there's movies like The Animated Grinch or A Christmas Carol. Let's call these Christmas conversion stories. The other camp is a little more rare, but just as interesting. These are what we call the uh, Christmas reality awakening stories. Now, that's the only true uh, Christmas carol right there, so <laughs> the, the Muppets. Uh, but these Christmas reality awakening stories, these are the stories of the people who celebrate Christmas, but out of proportion of reality or out of expectations what they want is destroyed, say like a Christmas bonus or something like that, so they can see Christmas as it truly is. So we see the two different types of movies of Scrooge and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Yes, we had the TV edited version of National Lampoon's, which I think was edited from two hours down to 90 minutes, so take that as you will. Uh, <laughs> Now, both of these kind of stories dealt with the same issue, awakening our senses to find out what we truly need. See, in stories like this, we try to answer this longing. What do we truly need? Now, stories are the expressions of our hearts taken to page. Now, why is this? Why are these so impactful? Every Christmas or non-Christmas stories, this is because we are part of a large epic story written by the master author. I have a video here from the organization called Spread Truth that kind of talks about where we are in our story. There is only one story that answers life's most essential questions and gives a lasting sense of purpose and meaning. It's the story that inspires all other stories. It's the true story that defines every one of us. This is that story. How did it all begin? Like all stories, this one begins in the beginning with the author, who is God. He spoke everything into being. With a word, galaxies appeared with stars and planets. Earth was designed for life to flourish. Everything God made was gloriously good and breathtakingly perfect. The highlight of God's creation was the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. God entrusted everything he created to his beloved children, giving just one rule. They were not to eat fruit from a specific tree. They lived in loving obedience, worshiping God as their heavenly father, and enjoying perfect harmony with creation, each other, and God. Considering our world today, it's obvious perfect peace didn't last. Turmoil, war, sickness, troubles. We each have our share. What went wrong? It started when a fallen angel named Satan grew jealous of God and determined to ruin the perfection of creation. Satan took the form of a serpent and enticed Adam and Eve to question God's goodness and rebel against his one rule. In disobedience they ate the fruit and peace unraveled, ushering in sin and death, which still plagues us today. If we are honest, we are very much like Adam and Eve. We all rebel against our Heavenly Father, making our hearts heavy with fear, guilt, and shame. Our bodies are weary with sickness, disease, and death. Earth is afflicted with storms, calamities, and disasters. Even worse, sin has separated us from God, 
causing a permanent divide, a miserable separation called hell. The fallout of sin has been catastrophic. It's inescapable with no way to fix it, leaving us all to wonder, is there any hope? The love that prompted God to create us also prompted Him to send a Savior who would set everything right again. As centuries passed, God shared exact details of the coming Savior's birth, life, and death. Everything in the Bible points to this rescuer. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to earth as God the Son to fulfill the promise. He was born miraculously, as His mother was a virgin. Just like us, Jesus grew up and experienced life on earth. But unlike us, Jesus never sinned and always obeyed the Father. When Jesus was in his 30s, he began teaching all around Israel, pointing people to God's kingdom and performing many miracles. After a few years, he was wrongly accused and sentenced to an agonizing death on a cross. Jesus lovingly gave up his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind. He died a perfect death, taking our place, the innocent for the guilty. But the grave couldn't hold Jesus. Three days later, God brought Jesus to life again. Jesus defeated sin by dying on the cross and defeated death by rising from the dead. Today, Jesus sits at God's right hand as king and judge over all creation. This is the story of rescue God has authored. He invites us, through repentance and faith, to make his story of rescue the one we trust in and live from. When we do, everything changes. You see, we are part of this story. This is our story. And the stories that we write, maybe dimly, reflect the story that we're in as an act of worship. Now, sometimes we love to make fun of our stories. Um, if you ever go on the internet, you look up story tropes. You know there's websites dedicated to every single story permutation and nitpicking everything. Guess what the number one most trope used is? The one of the chosen one. Interesting. But let's look at some classic stories. Let's look at King Arthur. If you like the Disney movie or the more story of the sword and the stone, he runs to get a sword for his friend Sir Kay. This is a sword in the stone. He pulls it out and becomes king of England. He is chosen by fate. Or more modern, Star Wars. And you know the line, you were the chosen one. He was born miraculously to be balanced to the universe. Or even if you're picked by a ring, came in possession of the one ring and showed remarkable resilience to it. But see, the stories not only mark our yearnings for things, but also need to reflect reality. None of those brave heroes succeeded. King Arthur's marriage fell apart, and with it, the round table and the kingdom. He presumed too much to go after the Holy Grail, the pursuit of holiness, and left his kingdom in the dust. Anakin Skywalker became one of the worst enemies of the empire. And his son, well, there's still wars going on in that long time ago, galaxy far, far away. Maybe even now, this is not a long time ago. And even Frodo falls to the power of the ring in the end. The reality is that the chosen one trope is one of the most deconstructed tropes in of all literature. Every writer wants to tell it in a new way to make sure their story is said in an unexpected way. But why do we want to tell it in a different way? Because even that resonates with us. The, we've lost our purpose and our way. We don't even know who we are. We know we want things to not be the way that they are, but we only seem to make things worse. Do we long for saving? We hope. But what is hope? Like most words, it's lost meaning. Let's go through some definitions. Merriam-Webster says to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. This is like saying, I really hope it snows for Christmas. Wishful thinking is not what we yearn for deeply. Well, let's take a look. How about dictionary.com? Because the internet is a vast repository of all human knowledge. It's the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. This is like saying, I hope I pass my finals. Expect- <laughs> May it be so. <laughs> Expectations of personal wants or events is not enough. 
That's escapism. Let's take a look at C.S. Lewis. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means a continual looking forward and is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. Hope in this sense is having God and his promises in mind. Let's take a look at one of the examples of the heroes of the faith. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. That is the hope that we live in, that we will be blessed by Abraham's descendant. Okay, so we need a correctly shaped hope. There's two errors against hope. And maybe you can see the parallel here with the two types of Christmas movies. One type of error is despair. The other is presumption. One is giving up all hope, like Scrooge. The other is what Augustine calls placing the hope in the perverted security of ourselves, like the Griswolds. It's all about my decorations or my Christmas bonus or whatever. This is taking it into our own hands and what we want to do. This is us trying to earn the hope. Or could be changing the promise to fit what we want, what we expect. And in doing so, you destroy hope. You see, for those who knew the story, they, like us, tragically fall in these two errors, despair or presumption. We want to be in control, or we just give it all up. The point about hope is that it's humble. It does not presume the thing that is hoped for. But hope is a defiant thing. It is only for the one who can hang on for 10 minutes after all hope is lost, after all is hopeless. Then hope begins to dawn. From G.K. Chesterton. If you know Lord of the Rings, how about hope is the feeling you get when you see Gandalf during the Battle of Helm's Deep. That's the feeling of hope. All is lost, but we held on long enough to see hope. Now let's take a look. Okay, we know the Christmas story. We've grown up in the Christmas story. One thing, we need to see this with new eyes. What was the world like at that time? You see, a culture is judged by its ideas. All ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. The world had fallen. There were multiple falls of the West. Now, I would argue the largest one was not what we call the medieval age or the dark ages. It was the time before Christ. You see, the world tried their best to build themselves up. And I'd say we're the closest we've ever gotten. Obviously, impossible to get there. The spirit of Delphi, you see in the picture, had won against the best the world had to offer. One of the greatest thinkers of all times came from the Greco-Roman Empire, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Well, Socrates was killed by government decree for corrupting the youth. Plato's students all became tyrants, chasing pleasure, power, or empty platitudes. The student of Aristotle, how about Alexander the Great? decimated the Mediterranean. The democratic experiment of Greece and Rome fell. An emperor now ruled over the known world with an army that was unrivaled. The Roman Empire is about the size of the United States. And while we rule here by, say, culture or shared values, that was by the rule of the sword. And philosophy itself, kind of the ideas that hold together a culture, became paganism. The world was lost. The best the world could offer in its thinkers and its art was defeated. Paganism had won. In The Everlasting Man, which is kind of a Christian history of the world, Chesterton writes, something was happening to the intellectual aristocracy of antiquity that had been walking about and talking at large ever since Socrates and Pythagoras. They began to betray to the world the fact that they were walking in a circle and saying the same thing over and over again. Philosophy began to be a joke It also began to be a bore. Everywhere, the sages had degenerated into sophists. Despair. There is no hope. Our great thinkers were defeated by politicians. Our great musicians are now just making words to sell pages. 
Our teachers are telling students how to manipulate others. Sophistry had won. This was the height of human achievement. I could argue Rome. I'm not saying Rome was good, but it was the best humans could ever do. Now, it was not the case that anything could conquer Rome. It was the case that nothing else could improve it. It had peaked and then became the slow and inevitable process of falling away. Civilization does not stop savagery. There was nothing that could answer the deep longings of the soul. See, without purpose, everything falls away. Without hope, things die. But our God is a God of spoilers. It's as if, because of his immense joy, he cannot contain the story to himself. A promise was given in the distant past of a blessing that would be for all nations. For 25 years, she had not born a son. Abraham feared that the promise was gone. But despite her grief and his disbelief, you gave your word and everything changed. There is a force that has changed the world, the family. It's the only social structure directly created by God before the fall. You see, the family is a paradox. They say that family are the friends God gives us. We have no control where we we're born or who we're born to, but to be in a family requires us to give up presumption. We give up control who we can truly love. This is God's invention, and it will always change the world. This was the promise to Abraham realized. Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since she was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had thought this over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place, so that what was spoken by the Lord, the prophet will be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And Mary took Mary as wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. For 400 years, we had not heard from you. When the angel appeared, not a moment too soon, to a humble girl in a broken world, you gave your word and everything changed. See, when the author of the story became a page in the book, this was not a peaceful entrance, nor could it ever be. This was a divine invasion. C.S. Lewis says that enemy-occupied territory, that's what this world is. Christianity is a story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say land in disguise. And it's calling us all to take part in the great campaign of sabotage. Think of the hope given to Europe during World War II when the Allies locked their foothold after D-Day. That's Christmas. Battle didn't stop there. Look at this picture. This is a modern day of the time representation of the Bethlehem census. No, nothing is still. There's action everywhere. There's pigs being slaughtered to pay taxes. There's a mother putting her child into the inn away from the crowd. The crowd's being counted and taxed. Where's Mary and Joseph? Uh, they're not in this frame. They're not important to the world's perspective. They're just another group of people forced from their houses to be counted to fund their oppressors. How ironic. See, at the chosen time, in your perfect way, in the dead of night, on a bed of hay, you gave your word, everything changed. Now remember, this is a divine invasion. The battle escalates. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Wow, that's pretty brazen. Um, <laughs> For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. After gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. From, from you will come forth the ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Jerusalem was invaded by Magi from the east. This is not like three people on camels. This is like a force. We know there are three gifts, but that's all we know. But this was something big. 
They went to Jerusalem because they're traveling dignitaries. Now, I love the understatement of massive proportions that uh, Jerusalem was worried all with him. Uh, Josephus notes that he had a bodyguard of at least 2,000 soldiers. His rule was on a knife edge. His power was there only by the pleasure of Rome, a very dangerous time to claim kingship. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined them the exact time a star appeared. And he said, go search carefully for the child. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, after you find him, report to me so I can go and worship him. And they went on and they gave gifts and they were warned by God not to return and left by their country to another way. That God provides an escape. After being warned by God not to return to Herod, the Magi left. An angel Lord appeared to Joseph and said, Get up, take the child and his mother to flee to Egypt and stay there, so I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. So this happened out what had been spoken by the Lord, the prophet would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. And then when Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent men and killed all the boys who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity and were two years old or under, according to the time we determined from the Magi. That would have been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. The hope given in ancient past was sustained by God. At least two prophecies fulfilled in these threats. See, the hope is a chosen one, but not in the way expected. There is humility and hope. God's promises are always kept, but as the master storyteller, they are never kept in the way we expect. They always end out better. See, every Christian needs to keep in mind that John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth were not what was expected. The Spirit came in a way not expected. The moral law, the theological truth were not contradicted, but revealed in ways not anticipated. Things turned out rationally, but exceptionally. You see, we can rely on God. We can have hope in his promises. We need not despair. It's not about us, it's for us. We need not presume. It's not in our control, it's in God's. God gave his word. It became flesh and dwelt among us, and everything changed. Dear Lord, we thank you for the great gift of your son, that humility that you had to give up everything for us, Lord. Thank you that not only you are the grand author, you are also the protagonist, and you, we, your bride, are the one you're rescuing. Lord, we love you for that, and thank you for that.